Hello and welcome back to a new and short special edition of my Floss Tube. Um, I'm very excited today to share with you that I have just launched the new chart for Susanna Walker 1848. This is her. Those of you who watched my last episode will have seen that I shared this already. And the last couple of days I have been working very hard to get Susanna all charted, checked for the right colours and do a little bit of stitching just to make sure that it all looks good. So uh, I mentioned it briefly in the previous episode. When I saw this, I just I just had to smile. It, it made me really, really happy to see this sampler. Uh, it is such a cheerful sampler. She's used all these lovely, cheerful colors. Uh, there's the beautiful red house and the ladies with the funny red cheeks, which I just adore. Um, but looking at this a little bit more, I thought it would be interesting to show, share you a little bit about the, not per se the history, but the time that this sampler was stitched. So it is stitched by Susanna Walker in 1848. Unfortunately, we don't know who Susanna was. There's no way to actually find out who she was as just assuming that she was 12 when she stitched that. You would looking be looking at a birth date around 18. 36 but there's already dozens of Susanna Walkers around that time the name is simply too common uh, for that time to give me any certain hits uh, but that didn't stop me to, from buying it as it is just such a charming sampler and we don't always need to know who she is I thought that this sampler was just really really charming it has a really sweet little verse at the top this needlework of leaves and flowers performed in my youthful hours will testify the pains I took as well with needle as with book. And of course, this was an educational piece as well. You, the girls would learn to stitch letters and they would learn to, to do fiber arts, which is really interesting. And I quite like that she stitched all her A's not closed off, as you can see here. And I thought the first A that I came across, I thought like, oh, the stitch fell out, but then it turns out to be all over the piece. This sampler is stitched fully in whole crosses with two small exceptions. The letter S, as you can see here, I'll bring it a little bit closer to the camera. She didn't have space to fit the whole text on anymore, so I think she started stitching the border for her little text. And then she realized that the word hours didn't quite fit on, so the only bit that's over one is just that tiny tiny bit here the s of hours so if you hate over one uh, it is just that little one there um, another quirk that she did was stitch the heads of the ladies they have a neck that's five crosses wide um, and it fits on the shoulder that's six crosses wide now that would mean technically that the head would be like that but she managed to squeeze it right in the middle in between two crosses so you have to go slightly off the grid and shift it it's all laid out in the pattern so you can follow that quite easily um, there is also 12 stitches of backstitch in the three little lambs here and that's the same color as the little pots and that's described in the pattern as well which color to use for that and it's quite clear where those little outline eyes are. So again, not a lot of backstitching at all. It's in total just 12 stitches, so that's also doable. And for the rest, I chose to simplify some of the borders as she made some errors and she made some little glitches in her stitching where she tried to fit things in, uh, stitching strange half stitches in, in some places, which I thought was not necessary uh, for the sampler to be uh, uh, stitched for you. Uh, so that's the sampler as it is. Now, I have been working very hard the last couple of days to just make sure that I had the right colors um, and that it all matched up. And I have nearly finished the house. So this is where I've gotten up to. And I, I really enjoy stitching this one. Um, houses are a lot of fun anyway. I, I really enjoy them. Uh, but this one is particularly a lot of fun. Um, I mentioned in my previous video that my favorite red is 3777 and I was very excited to uh, sort of find out that it is a near identical match to the one that Susanna was using on her sampler. Um, I had a little sort of goof that I made. Uh, um, so yeah, I goofed up. Um, I used the wrong color for the window so I had to unpick all of those and do them again. 
So I just have a few windows left now to do because that was already stitched. Um, the other error I made is these, I don't know whether they're timber frames or whether they're stone decoration. I think it might be the last one. I think it is a brick Georgian house with little stone in between, the sort of the white sandstone in between. I used the same color as the door, but I should have used the same color as the windows there. Um, it's a little error. I'm not worried because the, the color variation is very slight. Uh, it bugged me with the windows, but not so much with this stone as it does look quite like sandstone. Um, so I'm not going to change that. Um, it is correctly listed in the pattern. Um, so I, I really wouldn't worry about that. And I noticed when I was working on it as well that I had stitched the chimney before I had stitched this roof part and it turned out that the chimneys were one cross too high and I didn't feel like unpicking them. So my chimneys are seven crosses high and not six crosses high. Um, but we're not going to tell anyone except you guys. So that's where I am at at the moment. So for this little floss tube, uh, it's not going to be a long one, but I just wanted to sort of paint a picture of the sampler and the time that it was stitched in. So it is a sampler from the Romantic era and it's sort of toward the end of Romanticism or the Romantic era, as some people call it as well. And this was a style period in Europe from the sort of the very late 18th century um, uh, up to the 1850s roughly, it sort of overlaps a little bit uh, with all the styles. It's always difficult to pinpoint exactly when a style begins and ends. Um, I know that a lot of you love reading books and in sort of English literature you've got, you will be familiar with Jane Austen and she sort of sits sort of in that early part of the Romantic era. She, she grew up in the Romantic era in the, in the early years and when you see a good adaptation where the costumes are, are proper period appropriate you will see the earlier part of the Romantic era fashions and the Bronte sisters they lived in the 1840s 50s when they were actually writing their books. Um, Sadly, they died very young, uh, but in 1847-48, that's when some of their books came out, uh, which is exactly the year that Susanna stitched her sampler. Um, and when I saw this, it reminded me actually of um, sort of Bronte adaptations. It, it, it does have a little bit that style feeling. Um, and you see that the little women with their style and it, it kind of did remind me a little bit of, of uh, a beautiful BBC adaptation about the lives of the Brontes um, and it makes sense because the book sort of was uh, the, the series was about the period before they got their fame um, and that was around the 1830s and the fashion is a little bit old-fashioned that you see here it is the 1830s and not the 1840s fashion that you see here so we see a very low neckline here, which is something that in the 18 sort of 50s is disappearing quite a lot. Um, especially working class women would not be wearing necklines this low. Uh, the neckline would be going up and up more and more. Um, so it is a little bit old fashioned. Um, also, the sort of puffy sleeves that you see here are very much like uh, the fashions of the 1830s. Uh, they're called leg of mutton sleeves. Um, and it's really charming. The waist, for instance, is also very narrow, um, but that was actually, the waist was not as narrow, but it was accentuated because there was a lot of fabric above and below the waist, so the waist looked smaller than it actually was. Of course, they were sort of strung in corsets at that time as well, so the, the waist was unnaturally small. But it looked even smaller because of all the fabric above and below the waist. Um, the hairstyle, again, is slightly old-fashioned. Uh, it is, again, a, an 1830s hairstyle, so in the 1830s, I think when you look at period dramas uh, uh, and you look at sort of the Jane Austen pieces, you will see the women with the, the hair really big on the top and sort of big on the sides, and that's what you sort of see here happening. There's like a lot of hair on the side and on the top. Um, and you sort of see that when the Bronte sisters are younger, um, the, the, the women in, in, the, in the TV series, in the films that you see, they do have that hair on the sides and on the top. But by the 1840s, the later 1840s, it was getting flatter and the hair was sort of more in a, in a flat side parting with hair 
on the sides often. Uh, so fashions changed quite quickly in those days as well. Uh, now we sort of have this idea that fashion seems to be changing every sort of couple of months. But back then, it also there was a lot of influences that came and, and, and people were really trying to keep up with the latest fashions. Um, I love the checked dress. Uh, that is something that is really charming about this and as well and women really liked pattern fabrics uh, uh, in this era uh, you see a lot of beautiful checks uh, I found some really nice examples in the uh, the collection of the, the Victorian Albert um, and to honor Susanna I thought I would wear some checks today as well um, but it is really lovely there is green and red, so you have sort of these these tartan style checks that were quite popular uh, in those days. And doing some research uh, in old photographs uh, from several collections, I came across quite a few dresses from this period that have beautiful sort of checks on them. Um, and you can see the styles of the hairs as well in those photos, which is really beautiful. Um, the only thing that I really changed color-wise of this sampler was the green that you see here. It is very, very faded, the green, and green is one of the colors that tends to fade very quickly. Um, now this is, a lot of the time, it's not a big problem, but here you can see that you can sort of hardly make out that there is actually three little lambs, and what I think are two dogs. Um, it's a little bit difficult to see that, um, but they are very cute. Um, and I wanted to accentuate that slightly, so if you can see the color next to it, Let's see. You see that my green is still a, a very muted green, but it is a much more lively green than um, the one as it survived. Uh, unfortunately, because this is backed on some linen and I don't want to take the, the, the linen off the backing um, because I think it will damage the actual structure of this, this, this sampler. Um, so I can't actually look at the back of the fabric to check what the original colors were, uh, but I love the colors as they are here. So I kept most of the colors exactly as they are on Susanna's antique sampler, um, with the exception of the green. Um, the booklet, uh, the link to which you can find just below here, um, mentions all of the colors uh, charted for DMC. Now, you can pick your own color, so if you feel that you want to match the color a little bit closer, go for a slightly more gray-green. Um, I think the 6, 12 or 11, I believe it is, uh, is quite close. It's like a brown-gray color, which is quite close to that. Um, I've, I've used one of those two colors, I believe, in the sampler as well, but all the colors are listed in the um, uh, listing just in the uh, description below here as well, so you can see which colors you need. Um, the first three colors have uh, uh, more than 2,000 crosses, so you will need two or three uh, of those. The green one, you need three skeins of DMC. If you stitch with two strands, uh, the other ones you just need two, and for the rest, all of the colors, you just need one skein of DMC. Um, if you stitch it on 32 count, it will roughly be this size, so this is quite accurate to that. Uh, mine is on 36 count and I'm stitching with one pulled strand um, and I've been talking about stitching with one pulled strand for a while with some people as well I really like stitching with one pulled strand I do it on 32 count as well as I think it gives a more folklore feel um, which is more fitting and when you look at Susanna's sampler as well you can see that in the red there is a lot of fabric actually showing through so it, it you don't need the cover. It's not like uh, a tapestry piece where you you must cover the whole thing. Um, I think it is quite charming to sort of see a little bit of your linen through the stitches. Um, the linen that you want to stitch on, I tea dyed mine because I thought it would be really nice. And you can see as well that it is a little bit lighter than the original sampler, uh, which I quite liked as I thought it would stand out a little bit stronger. Um, I probably wouldn't recommend stitching it on, on pure white, I think that'll be a bit too hard. Um, but you can try tea dyeing your fabric, uh, which is always fun. I will be doing, I have been saying it and I've been promising it, I will do a tea, uh, a tea dyeing tutorial very soon, um, but it will probably be after the holidays. Um, 
Having said that, uh, I think that ends this little chat with you today. Um, so the pattern is out now. Uh, I hope you will enjoy the pattern. Uh, I'm really enjoying stitching Susanna. Um, and for now, this will be the last video before Christmas. So a very happy Christmas if you're celebrating uh, or otherwise happy holidays. Uh, stay safe, uh, look after yourselves and happy stitching and see you very soon. Bye bye.